We're doing a, a message called what? What's it called? This gospel. this gospel, right. And, you know, throughout the Bible, Jesus, well, especially in the gospels, the four gospels, Jesus is constantly telling us that we need to be preachers of this gospel. Gospel meaning good news. Like in Matthew 24, 14, he says, This gospel shall be preached throughout the world uh, as a testimony, and then the end will come. Now, it's important that you and I understand that everyone in this room is a preacher of the gospel. You're a communicator of the good news of what God has done, if you've been born again, that is, in your life. How many of you have a changed story? Raise your hand. Amen. Say, God has changed my life. Say, he's changed my story. Father, we come before you this morning, and we certainly want to thank you for, Lord, uh, what you have in store for us. Lord, you are the changer of hearts. You can take the simplicity of your word and cause it to come alive by the Holy Spirit. We give you place and position in this service. We magnify you. We honor you. We come to rally around your word, to hear what you have to say. And we thank you, Father God, that you will speak to our hearts, helping us to apply it not only to our personal lives, but to our generation. Lord, awaken us, we pray, giving you thanks. And everyone in agreement, in Jesus' name said, amen, amen. amen. High five your neighbors, say you're looking good this morning. I'm glad you're sitting next to me. Psalms 102 says, He shall regard the prayer of the destitute, and he shall not despise their prayer. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to the... Now, it says... He shall regard the prayer of the destitute. If ever there was someone who at that point in his life had a story where they felt destitute, empty, bankrupt, spirit, soul, and body, no answers, no solutions, it would have been a man by the name of Matt Tafute. He's telling his story of where he was at one point in his life. Sometimes our hearts are thrilled because we all know where we were one time or one, at one point in our lives, and maybe for some of us, several points in our lives. I could imagine it wasn't maybe a well-formed prayer. I could imagine it had a number of different emotions. I can imagine in having an opportunity to speak with Matt himself we can all understand that vantage point. And that's what I want to talk to us, all of us, the church, not just Word of Life, but the church, those watching by live stream, those watching by Facebook Live. What is our Christianity all about? What is my story all about? Is Christianity about me? experiencing the great salvation that only Jesus Christ can give us, and then, and then what? Jesus said, this gospel shall be preached as a testimony. You know, I once heard Pastor Bill Wilson from New York City once say, never forget where you came from, Pastor Art, never forget. And he was referring to, and I've shared it before, but he was referring to, never forget, when it was you that was destitute, when it was you that needed answers, when it was you that was confused, when it was you that didn't know which way to go. You know, Matt's story that you just heard was a man whose father was a pastor and he grew up in a church and yet there was a point there where he talks about where he didn't really believe and where God was real in his life. I remember growing up in a different environment, completely all together in a different part of the world. Going up into a church, going to church. What was my problem? 
drugs. That's right. My mother drugged me every Sunday to church. <laughs> Some of you are like, drugs, Pastor. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Should have gone there. You know, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. The whole earth. To show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. God has always needed a people to testify, to give testimony, to share of the good news that he has brought into their lives. The hardest thing for me to comprehend is the silent Christian. The Christian who only by choice chooses to be silent and tell no one of their changed story. You cannot find that person in the gospel. That person is never encouraged to be silent. But rather it tells us of the time frame in which we have and the good news which we have. You may not have someone else's story, but you do have a story of transformation, a story of redemption. A story of God's unconditional love. A story of his amazing grace. A story of his mercy. A story of his restoration. Give him great praise and honor this morning. And many of us, we can understand that we can identify with Psalms 102 because in our day, the Lord regarded the prayer of our destitute position. And he did not despise our prayer because we didn't have all the scripture verses in line. We didn't have great long, we just, some of us were desperate and just cried out, if you're real, help me. But it says that in the Old Testament, he hears the groaning of the prisoner. And by the Holy Spirit, Paul the Apostle, in the book of Colossians, is writing a letter to the church there in Colossians. And towards the conclusion of that letter, he says, and say to our chippest, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Before I move on, this is where I want to compel every believer, every Christian, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord to open your, open your eyes let God fill your ears. Let him touch your heart to the ministry that you have received. You as a born again believer have a ministry. A ministry that God has given you by virtue of just being a believer. To testify. To not be silent of the good news of your changed story. By the cross through his blood in the name of Jesus. But our chip is, for reasons we've brought up, and I'll give you a little bit more background here today. He was being encouraged to take heed to the ministry. And um, why our chip is, was delaying? Why was he in doubt? Why was he hesitating? Why was he making excuses? Probably for the same reasons people in every church in the world do. Because there is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. The last thing that your adversary, the adversary, the kingdom of God would want you to do is to ever testify of the goodness of God. For you to testify to anyone else who's living a Christless life and headed for a Christless eternity, to hear that there is an opportunity to turn around in the name of Jesus. And no matter what their situation, there is redemption. No matter how bad you feel, there is restoration. 
No matter what the doctors or reports are, there is a healer who will make you whole spirit, soul, and body. And the thing we have to ask, why am I silent? Why are you so important as an individual believer that the adversary would work overtime to keep you silent? To keep you from sharing your story, your eternal testimony. Why would he work so hard that you would, that, not you per se when I say the word you, but when we, the church, would conjure up excuses and get, allow ourselves to get diverted and misplace priorities and, and misalign ourselves in the name of fabricating potentially a different gospel, a gospel that Jesus did not teach, a gospel that the Holy Spirit does not lead us to be silent. But I want to share with you a little bit of the background of Archippus. Archippus, when he was born again, putting things in perspective, and every Christian is this way as well, is to be an influencer, not to be influenced. We are here to make an eternal difference. We don't make the difference. We simply become, I like calling myself the milkman. I just deliver the milk. I didn't produce it. Amen? I got to run my routes. You know what I'm saying? Like I used to, when I was growing up, I used to have a, a paper, they called it back then a paper route. I imagine they call it the same thing. And I'd have subscribers in my area and it was, I didn't have to print the newspaper for Santa Barbara County, but I had to fold them up, roll them up, and put them in the bags and go and deliver them house to house. You know, I, didn't, I was just a delivery boy. And the thing is this, today we got better news than a temporary newspaper. We have an eternal message. Now, what you probably didn't know, he's writing, and we hear about this Paul the Apostle. So, and, uh, and Paul's writing the letter. But what you may have not known is Paul the Apostle never ever went to Colossian. He never visited the town of Colossian. He wrote a letter to them because somebody was converted under his ministry and became a disciple of Paul the Apostle, and he started the church. He was the founder of the church in the city of Colossae, which was 100 miles east of Epaphras, Epaphras, Ephesus. His name was Epaphras, all the E's, you know. And, uh, and so it's important that you and I know this, but in the letter that was written to to Colossians is a letter that's very important because Epaphras, say Epaphras, okay, these two names, I'll, I'll keep you in order here, was needing Paul the Apostle's help because his city was being bombarded with false teaching. There was a blend of pagan occultism with Jewish legalism and Christianity all being mixed into one big ball. It was an early form of what's called Gnosticism. The teaching was that Jesus was really not fully God, but merely semi-divine. And that the teaching that others were doing was that Jesus was lacking the authority and the ability to really make a difference in the city of Colossae. The teaching was also, if you are really enlightened, if you are really, you know, intellectually an enlightened person, then you'll be open to other teachings and other um, forms of knowledge, and of course, the extreme version of what's called self-discipline or works. 
the, the teaching and why Paul wrote at the behest of a man by the name of Epaphras, this is all going to tie in, was because there were people that were trying to undercut major doctrine at the time, the veracity of scriptures, the, what you and I know as the Trinity, the uh, authority, in fact, uh, of Jesus Christ, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And Paul the Apostle addresses all those things. They were talking about visions that they had and angels that they seen and that supersedes the scriptures. It was, um, it was what's called religious pluralism. It was a, a diluting of truth for the sake of unity. Enough for you to know about that. Simply it's this. Let's all get together in the name of getting along with one another and whatever religion you want to bring, I'll bring my Christianity, you bring your occultism and you bring your habits and you just put it all together. Let's just all be friends. You know, that's called compromise. And this was so bothering the founder of the church there. He knew exactly where he was going to Paphras that he, he wrote Paul and said, Paul, I need you with the authority and the wisdom that you have to address this. And so Epaphras, as you well know, he, was a, he, he understood that if he doesn't influence, he will be influenced. That the church was there to influence, not to succumb to the influence. Well, you find that same talk in today's society. I mean, there's all kinds of people with all kinds of versions. Paul the Apostle talked about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, be careful for those who come with the cunning of the devil, with another gospel, with another Jesus, and with another spirit. Exactly what was going on in Colossae. Paul addresses, there is not another gospel. There is not another Jesus. And there is not another spirit. Epaphras was a prayer warrior. In Epaphras, it says in an amplified version, it says that he was a laborer. He was another, of course, he was a disciple of Paul, but he prayed the way Paul taught him to pray. Pray for the people in the city. That's why this, tomorrow we're starting five, seven days of prayer. We normally start tonight, but we have Dr. Jesse DePlantis. Come on, somebody. Amen. Don't take my time by clapping. Stop. <laughs> now you're laughing. Stop. And, um, and so what you need to understand is Paul the Apostle has taught Epaphras to pray. And Epaphras prays five things. Number one, found in Ephesians chapter 4 in the Amplified Version, that all the believers in the place called Colossae, as well as Laodicea in another city that he mentions, would have ripe character. Number two, clear conviction concerning the gospel. Number three, that they would be able to stand firm when assaulted and persecuted. Number four, that they would have a hunger to continue to grow in the things of God. And number five, that they would be fully convinced and everything willed by God. That's found in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Paul wrote the letter encouraging the Christians to not let go of their zeal nor their loyalty to the Lordship of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But in Colossians chapter 4, because of time, verse 16. I'm going to read verse 16 and 17 together. And this will give you a little bit of understanding of this person by the name of Archippus. Now, Paul is writing this letter. He says, now when this epistle, which is letter, is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, 
take heed to the ministry for which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Now, if you know anything in the Bible, some of you do, and uh, I don't mean to say that in a wrong way for some of you who may not know. Laodicea is written, is one of the churches in the book of Revelations, one of the seven churches. Revelations chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. It was the church of the lukewarm or the church of the compromise. Epaphras is praying for Laodicea and for Colossae. He's praying because there is a spiritual battle going on, meaning the forces of darkness are trying to influence the church then as the forces of darkness try to influence the church now. Be not mistaken, Colossae, or the city of Colossians is put that way, and Laodicea, they were very, especially Laodicea, where apparently Archippus was. You know, that's the scripture in Revelation 3.15 says, I'd rather have you hot or rather have you cold, but if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out. Today in America and across the nations of the world, it's sad to say there are too many Christians that are satisfied where they're lukewarm, compromised, mediocre stand when it comes to the gospel. Turn your neighbor and say, not in this house. And what happened to our Chippus? He backed away. He excused himself. It's not my call. It's not my this. It's not my that. But you see, there's a breath of encouragement that comes. When Paul the Apostle by the Holy Spirit said to him, And say to our Chippus, there are chippuses here in this room because you know what? We're all our chippuses. To some degree, we are all our chippuses because every our chippus has received the ministry of the Lord. If you're in school in your university, that's your sphere of influence. If you wear, uh, work in, in executive corporate areas, that's your sphere of influence. If you're in our military, some of our bases around your that's your sphere of influence if you're a stay stay at home mom or dad you know your neighborhood that's your sphere of influence you and i have a mission field to reach with the gospel to testify of the goodness of god and his resurrected power come on somebody i mean i'm talking about some good news here today the bible says that god is good and all the time and to Everybody, turn your neighbor and say, that includes you. Here's what I want you to see, though. Laodicea was a very, 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 what you and I would consider back then, very contemporary city. It was a banking center of commerce, much exchange of trades. It was well known, uh, Laodicea was. In many ways, that's where Archippus was. But Archippus had been born again. But it's kind of like Israel. When Israel got delivered out of Egypt, Egypt didn't quite get delivered out of Israel. They still had the tendencies to go back. And here, though, I hear a, a sound. If you listen carefully, you can hear it. The sound of the Holy Spirit through Paul the Apostle and say to Archippus, say to the Christian called Archippus, say to the disciple called Archippus, say to the believer called Archippus, say to that born again new creation individual by the name of Archippus, take heed to the ministry. Take heed to the ministry for which the Lord has given you that you might fulfill it. You might try to walk, people might try to walk, people try to say, that's not me, that sounds interesting, but that's not me. It is all of us. We're all called to do our part. And be believers like myself, uh, uh, who's assigned to be a pastor, are called to equip you that you might do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Every one of you have a part to play in the Great Commission. Somebody who's destitute 
who is praying in the day of our chippis, as in our day to day, is right now in our cities, in their homes, in their situations, crying out for God to do something. And God says, I've done it, and I will do it. Because he doesn't turn away the prayer of the destitute, nor does he despise their prayer, he says. He looks down from heaven and he sees and he knows exactly. God has not turned a blind eye to you. God has never turned a blind eye to hurting humanity. But what ends up happening is the enemy comes to steal the validity and the importance of you having a ministry where you share your story. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, for the rest of your life, I hope you never forget this. And I know you won't. Maybe our chip is for God, what Paul had said, that he was a living letter to be known and read by all men. Your life is a testimony. Maybe he forgot what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, that, that God has made us to be ministers and dispensers of the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, years ago, when we started, and we are starting to get some traction, we felt like we were like the Archippuses. We knew that what little understanding we had, we had to do something about people in our city. God doesn't want to raise up a church, or, or God doesn't call you just to be saved so you can sit longer and spread it out wider. You know, I like what Bishop Oriel says. He says, you've been, you've been saved to serve. You know, and then there are people that say, well, Pastor Ron, what about ministry to me? Well, let me tell you, there's enough God to minister to you, enough of God to minister through you. But we, we, uh, when we get just focused on ourselves, we think it's all about me and me getting served. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. God God wants your family stronger and God wants your life stronger in every, in every capacity. But your life is not limited to you. Your Christianity is not limited to you. You and I have been called by the Lord Jesus Christ to testify of the gospel to all nations. And then the end will come. Just continue to worship Jesus with us. How thankful are you for the cross?
with a heart of thanksgiving that you have called us to be like an archippus in our in our day and age for our generation may we have learned father seen father god what you want us teach us lead us and guide us out of your word thank you father god that you are the life transformer father we have made a decision today lord to not be silent but to speak of the good news to tell people when the opportunity is before us to share our story that you and you alone change and get all the glory for we thank you lord Watch over every person. Keep them strong. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap.